So good evening all and welcome to this evening's webinar from the Tom and Tal and Glenn Livett Cairngorms Dark Sky Park. My name is David Newland and I've been involved with our Dark Sky Park project since about 2014. Sam Robinson's the secretary of the Cairngorms Astronomy Group and will be telling you all about the sun a little bit later on. But first of all, I'm going to give you a quick tour of the night sky as seen from our dark sky discovery site at Scallon. I'll be pointing out the main constellations and um, brighter stars, planets before handing over to Sam for this evening's main presentation. If you've got any questions, please ask them as we go along. We'll do our best to answer them at the end of the session. But before we begin, I'm going to quickly run you through the controls available to you on your Zoom screen. Up there on the top right hand corner of your screen is a drop down menu to control your view of the proceedings. Uh, you've got three choices. You've got a gallery view, a speaker view and a full screen view. On the bottom left of the centre, there's a Q&A session or button which you can use to ask us to clarify any points arising from the presentations. And just over to its right, there's a chat button to communicate with panellists and other attendees while the webinar is in progress. So without more ado, I'm going to get on, see if I can get this um, uh, night sky to again. It's just a question of remembering when's, which buttons to press. So hopefully you're looking at a screen of the night sky up there um, uh, facing north. And if you are interested by the strange language, I, I, I should be in trouble. This isn't a strange language. It's Scottish Gaelic. I'm not going to pretend to be a expert in this at all. Um, but these are the um, constellations according to um, the ancient Scots. Uh, both Gallic and Pictish. Up here in the top of the uh, um, screen we've got uh, the plough and cran. The plough was actually the original designation uh, given to that this, this asterism by the um, ancient Gallic Scots. And if you look over to the left there are two stars here the pointers point over to a very uh, important star, uh, Polaris down here. Um, Polaris is a yellow supergiant. It's part of a three star system. It's about five times the mass of the sun. And it's a fair old distance away from us. It's about uh, 400 light years, um, which is why otherwise it would appear a massive amount brighter. Um, this star was known as the guiding star because it's uh, been a pretty reliable guide to where North is for the past uh, thousand years at least. If we move down uh, just over to the right of the pole star, uh, there's a long sinuous uh, um, constellation, which is now called, uh, oh, I've forgotten, the Draco is what it's called now. Um, what the Picts knew this as was the Afangdu. It was a monster that lived in a lake in a cave and it would eat anyone foolish enough to try going for a swim or to fall in the lake. Um, a little bit further down, we have got, um, and over to the left, uh, we've got Cassiopeia, the, the constellation now known as Cassiopeia, to the, um, it's still known as the chair in Gaelic, Scots Gaelic, and this chair um, is said to have belonged to Danu, who is the mother of the gods for the Gallic uh, Celts. Just heading down um, uh, over to the west, uh, we've got uh, the red planet, Mars. We call it Mars. Uh, the ancient Celts called it Goak. It was, this was the red wandering star of their champion, Ogmos. I've got, another, I've got a westerly view now to show you. Um, and um, Mars has moved right to the bottom. 
And there are a couple of other constellations we ought to have a look at on the way over there. Um, just above um, Mars, we've got a constellation that's now known as Perseus. Um, in Pictish legend, this was actually Drosten. Um, Drosten is the Pictish method of pronunciation. You, you may know, know the name better as Tristan, as in Tristan and Isolde. And down there on the right is um, Isolde, um, Esilt uh, in the um, ancient Pictish uh, pronunciation of it. And there's a, a legend told about these two. Um, Drosten was sent over to Ireland to bring Isolde back to marry the king. And on the way back in the boat, um, they accidentally uh, consumed a love potion. They fell helplessly in love with one another. And the things just went from bad to worse. Uh, uh, they were pretty inevitable. And eventually they were both sentenced to death by the king. Um, but they managed to escape into the night sky. So there they are, up there now, looking the us. Uh, moving off uh, a little bit uh, further along, we, we come to a beautiful star cluster um, called the, that we call the Pleiades. Now, to the ancient Celts, um, this was uh, a magical bag that was made from a crane skin. And the crane was actually the fairy wife of Mananan. And she had been turned into a crane by her jealous rival, Iacra, when they were off swimming in the sea. She lived for a long, long time. I think it was over 200 years. But when she died, um, um, and Alan wanted a memento of her. So what he did was he had her skinned and made a bag out of her. And um, in the bag, he kept a, a, a number of magical implements, which helped him in his trade of being a Celtic god. Uh, just moving over to the left, we've got um, um, what the bull. I don't know if you can just about see a bull in there. There's his horns and there's his face in the normal place. Um, uh, Aldebaran is the star here. And it's a red giant, about one solar mass. And its um, hydrogen is now all exhausted. So it's busy um, fusing helium. Uh, to, to support itself against the uh, um, influence of gravity. Um, it was called Don Cooley, uh, representing the brown bull of Queen Maeve that she had decided to steal, steal from Ulster. Um, Ulster was actually the ancient home of the Gallic Scots. Um, as usual in Celtic legend, this all went bad because um, there was a battle and it culminated in single combat between Cahulin and Ferdiad, and um, uh, Ferdiad came off worst. Moving on now, if we go up a little bit further, we come to the constellation that we now know as Auriga around here. Um, this was also a charioteer to the Celts. Uh, moving left, we come to what we now call Gemini. And these were known as the rivals to the in Pictish mythology. And these are, these are two gods, the god of winter and the god of summer. And the reason they're rivals is because every year they spend a lot of time fighting and at the spring equinox, um, winds would be overcome by the summer. And at the autumn equinox, the roles were reversed as winter gazed ascendancy over the summer. Um, moving down below the feet of Gemini, um, we've got a very well-known uh, constellation here. Um, this in the Scottish, for the Scottish um, Celts, was Finn McCool, a hunter-warrior. He, he was the son of Cool, a uh, leader of the Fianna, and um, his, his father had been killed by Gol McMorna who took over the leadership of the band of warriors. Um, the young F Finn McCool arrived at Tara with his father's crane skin bag of magical weapons, um, which he had somehow inherited. And he kept himself awake by using the red hot spear that was one of those implements. And um, eventually he was able to kill Alien the Burner with the magical spear and Gol willingly stepped aside to become a loyal follower 
of Finn McCool, who, who led that, that band of hunter warriors from then on. Moving up to the left, we have got uh, quite a change on the Greek Roman mythology that most are used to. Uh, this is probably best called the horse. It represents Maka, who was one of the uh, three sister goddess, goddesses known as the Morrigan. Uh, now, she, uh, th there was a farmer called Krunek, and um, his wife died, and shortly afterwards, um, Maka turned up on the doorstep, and um, she was keeping house for him, soon she became pregnant, but she warned him that he had to keep quiet about her, because if he spoke a word of her to anyone, then she would just go away, and that would be the, the, the end of it. Now, one day he had to go off to a festival organized by the king. And uh, during a chariot race, he boasted that his wife Maka could run faster than the king's horses. So the king ordered Kriniak to make good his claim. He goes off, collects his wife, and although she's he heavily pregnant, she's brought to the gathering and the king forces her to race the horses. Of course, she wins, but gives birth to twins on the finish line. And all, all ends badly because she curses the, the, the king's men for putting her through uh, su such a test when she was pregnant. Um, moving along, we, I'm just going to turn it around to the south because just to the west of the um, Maka, we have um, a constellation that most of you will know, I think, as Leo. Um, funny thing about lions, actually, I hadn't noticed any in Scotland. I think maybe 100,000 years ago, there, there were some cave lions about, but in, in Celtic times, uh, they, they were completely unknown. Uh, so this doesn't represent a lion at all. It represents a young deer in Celtic mythology. Um, it represents Ossian, who is the, one of the sons of Finn McCool and also a, a warrior of the Fania. The, the Fianna. Um, his name literally means a young deer or fawn. Now, the, the, the reason that came about is because a druid had turned his mother into a deer before he was born. And uh, uh, so he was found by his father's dogs, Bran and Skierlin. Uh, he was eventually regarded as one of the greatest of all poets and the composition of so, some of the um, major um, uh, cycles of uh, um, Celtic stories have been attributed to him. That's Ossian. Moving over to the uh, left, we will skip over Blodwith <laughs> and a light on Booties um, with its star Arcturus just down here. Um, Math was um, a, a Pictish figure, a Pictish god probably, um, and he, he, one of his um, failings was whenever he needed to rest, he needed to put his feet in the lap of a virgin, or apparently he would die. Um, now, his nephews plotted against him, and um, he was lured away in order to fight a neighbour, Pridery. Um, and that was mainly through the magical machinations of his nep nephew, Gwydion. Now, while Maths away, um, fighting um, Pridery, um, Gwydion's brother Gifalthi rapes um, Gerwin and on his return Math went to rest his feet in her lap but he found he couldn't because she was no longer a virgin. Um, so he took her as his wife to save her honour and here just below Booties ready to have his feet put in her lap is Gerwin which is, we now know as um, uh, Virgo, of course. And uh, moving just over to the left, we have the moon, um, which represents the goddess Maeve. And um, a little bit further up, I'm, I'm going to turn you, turn you around a little bit further into the east. Um, so here's Gerwin, here is uh, uh, Math. And I'm going to rely on Care Ariane Rods, because this is Corona Borealis that we call it these days. And to the ancient Celts, um, 
Our Anne Rod was the daughter of Don, the mother of the gods in, Pils in Pictish legends. And this is where she lived, it was up in what we now call Corona Borealis. Moving to the left, we've got the figure of Dagda, um, which I think we now call Hercules. One of the chief of the Gallic gods, he had three magical possessions, a staff that killed with one end and brought back to life with the other. He also had a cauldron that never ran, ran empty. It was very, very, very handy if you were going around there for a feast. Uh, you were guaranteed to have always had enough to eat there. And over on the left, his left, um, what we now call the Lyra, was Dagda's harp. Uh, and that harp could control men's emotions and change the season. So magically powerful it was. So that um, ends my sky tour for this evening. I hope that's been a, um, perhaps a little bit unusual uh, and, and a different interpretation of the sky to the ones that you're used to. And um, it's now time for me to welcome Sam to talk to you all about the sun. Sam, take it away. Okay, thanks David. I'm Sam Robinson. I'm the secretary of the Kian Gorms Astronomy Group. And tonight's talk is going to be about the sun, our very own star. Um, it's maybe a bit of an eccentric view of the sun I've got here, but just uh, start off on the slideshow. Uh, right, okay, so the sun, uh, we can see here the sun, this is a, the, um, a very dynamic view of the sun. This is the, this is the chromosphere we are seeing which is not the bit that we can normally see with the naked eye, except uh, during a, um, a solar eclipse. Um, it's worth um, emphasizing this right at the start with the sun. It's not a good idea to look directly at the sun for any great length of time. You will damage your eyesight. And if you have a telescope or a pair of binoculars, do not under any circumstances point it at the sun, um, unless you really know what you're doing and using um, specialist telescopes and specialist filters. It's a, very dangerous thing to do to point the telescope at the sun. Having got that out of the way, um, we can see that in the past the, the sun and um, the sun has very many um, positive attributes, not least of which is it tells you what time it is to get up. Um, but the, um, the sun ruled the lives of our ancestors and to ourselves to a great extent. It provides the, the light and heat that we see here in the earth and it's also um, the earliest um, form of accurate clock and uh, allows us to keep a very good um, uh, very good measure of time. If we look at the sun, this here is something some of you might recognize. Um, if you have a globe, you may find this weird shape sitting in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Um, that's usually because that's the part of the globe that doesn't have much writing on it. And this is called the analemma. And it's basically, um, if you take um, a fixed camera, uh, don't move it, just keep it in the same position, fix the exposure, and take a picture of the sun every clear day at exactly the same time, ignoring uh, daylight saving time, or British summer time and the like. And um, then this is the pattern that will show in the sky. And here we can see the sun at its most northern extent in this picture, and down here at the southern extent. And you can notice that this loop at the top here is not quite the same size as the loop at the bottom. This is caused by the fact that the Earth is, um, doesn't go around the, the sun in a circle, it's an ellipse, and it moves faster in January when it's closest to the sun, which is why this bit of the uh, loop is more spread out. Um, the movement sideways um, just basically tells you the difference between the sun is measured by a sundial and the sun is measured by a clock. Um, sundial time um, varies a bit through the year. Um, Clock time is a more accurate way if you wish to measure the interval between things or do things at the same time every day or meet somebody at a given time, clock time is far preferable. And that is, shows the difference between clock time and what you would uh, see on a sundial. Now the ancients had, um, uh, had some pretty unusual ideas of what the sun was, not surprisingly, from being a burnished shield um, carried by a chariot across the sky to many other strange theories, winged serpents and all manner of things. But 
the uh, the ancients in classical times, the Greeks, um, had a fairly good handle in science, although they didn't get it right, all right. Uh, but some of them made some quite big advances in our knowledge of what the sun is and was. Now, I've got this chap here, Aristotle, in the wrong place. He should be down at the bottom because he comes after these two. So I'll discuss the other two first. And the first one is Aristarchus of Samos, and a very fanciful statue probably erected many years after he was dead. Um, he was the first person to propose that the sun was at the center of the solar system. Most um, uh, belief before then was that the earth was at the center for the fairly obvious reason that you're standing on the earth and you see the sun go around the sky. So it's the natural thing to do to assume that the earth is in the center. Um, this other Greek chap here, Eratosthenes, um, who was um, a very remarkable um, geometer. He managed to measure very accurately the size of the earth um, using a well and some, um, and some Roman marching signs. Um, and he also made an, a, a, a fairly, a, a remarkably accurate estimate of the distance to the sun. He wasn't that far off the mark, although there is a bit of dispute about how you how interpret his figures, but he did have a good idea that the sun was very far away. Um, Aristotle held that the, that the earth was the center of the solar system. That was his take on it. And also that all celestial bodies orbited the earth in circles, in perfect circles. Um, unfortunately, science was held back to a great extent by Ar Aristotle's theories, which became over time enmeshed with the, um, with the dogma of the church. And uh, as a result of which Western science didn't really get a handle on the solar system um, until the, mid at the end of the Middle Ages, indeed the beginning of the Renaissance. This was started by um, Nicholas Copernicus here, a uh, Polish chap, and he um, went against the doctrine of the church and argued that the sun was at the center of the solar system. And the motion of the planets in the sky is extremely difficult to explain if you have the earth at the center. And the Aristotelian theory um, had to have many extra parts added to it to account for the motion of the, of the uh, planets. So it was only a matter of time before um, people began to look uh, for another way of uh, modeling the solar system. And once he had, um, once he had um, uh, put forth his theory, which he did actually on his deathbed, um, I don't know if he quite had enough um, oomph to, um, to go against the, uh, the Catholic Church and indeed some other uh, famous scientists in, uh, in, later, in later days um, did fall foul of the church and suffered some quite severe penalties as a, as a result. Um, the German uh, mathematician Kepler came along and using um, some very accurate um, um, measurement data um, that was assembled by that Danish nobleman with the unpronounceable name. I'll make an attempt at it. I think it's something in the order of Tuchel Bra. Um, that was the chap who had a silver nose um, to replace the one he lost in a duel, kept a dwarf, and it generally was quite a colorful character. Um, he did, however, make very, very accurate measurements of, the, uh, of the, the motions of the planets, and Kepler used these to devise his laws of planetary motion, where he showed that the um, planets didn't go around the sun in circles, they went, they went round in ellipses, and as a result of which traveled a bit faster when they were closer to the sun. Um, and indeed, his, his um, mathematical equations allow us to predict where the planets will be with quite a high degree of accuracy. Finally, Newton came along and formulated the law of universal gravitation, which explained not just um, what, how the planets moved, but why they moved in that manner, and uh, what really set the whole thing in motion. The sun is a star. This is a picture actually from the, uh, a very crowded area from the center of the galaxy taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. And as you can see, there are many stars of different colors and brightnesses. And I'm afraid to tell you that the sun is probably very close to one of these small yellowish dots. It's not one of these bright ones. And I, that's actually good news. Um, we, do, we don't really want the sun to be a particularly spectacular star. Um, where we are in the ga galaxy, where the sun is, is also unremarkable. We're halfway out from the center um, in a, an area called the Orion Spur. And indeed, the closest um, large star, the closest large molecular cloud where stars are formed um, is in Orion and it's fairly close to us. 
That's why it's the brightest. Now, if you classify stars, if you take out the stars and classify them according to their temperature down here and their true brightness or luminosity, um, you find that stars settle along this diagonal line here. Basically, as we go right, stars get redder. And as you would expect, being less hot, they are not quite as bright. They're quite low down on the luminosity. As we go up towards the top left, stars get much hotter. And again, as you would expect, they are also much brighter. The sun's right in the middle here. Um, and on this main sequence, this is where stars are burning their hydrogen at a steady rate where they spend most of their lives and when they're at their most stable. We don't really want to be anywhere near these giants up here. These are the, um, these are the big kids on the block here. You don't really want to be close to them. Um, these hot stars up here um, are really um, pretty dangerous stars. They give out, although they don't live for very long, only a few million years, as opposed to a few billion years for the sun and the, the red dwarfs down here. The stars up in the top left uh, emit so much of their um, so much of their their light, their energy in ultraviolet that they would print in short order sterilize any planetary system that managed to form round about them. So really, you don't want these stars, these giant stars here, and the sun itself will migrate in this diagram up to where this um, giant yellow sun is. And this will happen much later in its life when it starts to run out of hydrogen and has to start burning helium. Um, and in these, in these um, circumstances, when these stars swell, they engulf the inner planets. And some of these supergiants up here would probably engulf the entire solar system, or at least all the way out to the outer planets. And it's a very good thing that the sun is unexceptional. The sun in relation to the solar system is, extreme, is, is huge. It's about 100 times the diameter of the Earth. Um, or about a million times its volume. So if the sun was a hollow sphere, you could fit about a million Earths inside. And even the giant planet Jupiter and Saturn um, are really very small compared to the sun. The sun rotates every, roughly every 26 days. Um, and it, because it's not a solid body, it's actually a fluid body, its central regions here around its equator rotate faster than the polar regions up near the top. Um, I'll get back to that later. That is the reason why the sun has such great magnetic activity. Now, the solar system, um, the present theories of the birth of the solar system uh, are that for um, whatever reason, for some reason, a large molecular cloud began to condense. And it's not easy for these clouds to condense because as they condense, they heat up and that heat stops them condensing further. So they really need an outside stimulus. And it's thought that nearby massive stars which have reached the end of their lives and explode in violent supernovae. And the shockwave from these can act to compress a cloud enough that gravity takes over and it can overcome this heat barrier. As it collapses, it will have an intrinsic spin. Everything in the universe has some sort of spin. And as it, um, as it contracts, the material will flatten into a disk. That's a consequence of its rotation. And you can see inside here, this large yellowish white area, which is where the sun is beginning to form. And in this next stage, you can see that the sun has formed a protostar, but also the planets have uh, started to accrete in the, from the disk and are clearing out dust-free lanes. And in the final picture, this is the, the solar system, much as it is now, the sun is condensed to be a star uh, and the planets um, go around, they've cleared out their objects, there's not much debris, except around where the asteroid belt is. Um, and generally, um, this is the mature state of the solar system. Uh, you'll notice also that the rotation of the sun is the same as the rotation of the planets. Um, all the planets go around the sun in the same direction, which again suggests that they all form from the same rotating cloud. Now, as if to prove that, here is a picture of a, a nearby star, HL Tauri, in the constellation of Taurus the Bull. And this is a picture taken with the ALMA, the um, submillimeter and microwave um, radio array in, in the Atacama Desert in Chile. And here we can see around this star, we can see that lanes are already being cleared out. And in all likelihood, planets are beginning to form um, in these uh, rings um, around the star. 
And to get some idea where all this fits in in our time scale, um, the sun um, was formed just before the formation of the Earth, uh, with only a few million years prior to that. Um, and this period of time as the Earth condenses and then the moon forms um, and the first rocks form on the surface of the Earth, you can see that life possibly um, formed only a billion years after the sun and the Earth formed. And up until about this point, the sun was a bit dimmer, I think, than it was the present theories think the sun was a bit dimmer uh, than it is now. But it's increased in brightness. And for this entire period, its brightness has stayed almost exactly the same, right up to the present day, past the dinosaurs, up to the modern human society. And the so-called solar constant, or the amount of energy received at the Earth from the sun, i.e. the amount of energy that's falling on the upper atmosphere, um, is about one and a quarter kilowatts per square meter. Um, but it varies by less than 0.1% from year to year. And uh, that's been true for the last 400 years. And looking at the fossil evidence, it's quite likely that it's been very much the same uh, for the vast majority of the Earth's history. Uh, when we look at the sun, we tend to see this, the visible surface of the sun, which is called the photosphere, um, for photon for light. Um, and on the surface, we can see some blemishes. This was a picture that was taken, I think, when the sun was fairly active. We have a large sunspot here. And these can be seen with the naked eye at, at, when the sun is setting. If the sun is behind some cloud and its light is um, attenuated quite a lot, so it's safe to look at the sun. When the sun is very active, you can indeed see um, large sunspots on the sun. And from day to day, they will gradually make their way across the solar disk, uh, taking about 13 days probably to get from one side to the other. So there'll be a slow progression across the solar disk. Now, a closer look at the sun, uh, sorry, this is another look at the sun um, during um, a total solar eclipse. And here we don't see the photosphere because it's covered up by the moon. And it's one of the great coincidences of the universe that the moon happens to be the same angular diameter, more or less, as the sun. And sometimes it's a little bit smaller, sometimes it's a little bit bigger. And when it's a little bit bigger, what you can get when it passes right in front of the sun is a total solar eclipse. And that allows us to see this pink area here called the chromosphere, the sphere of color. And also this pearly color here from the corona which is hot gas that is streaming off the sun. We see here a prominence as well. This is a, an erupting surface of gas from the sun. And the chromosphere, this line here, which is actually, because the moon is almost exactly the same diameter as the sun, angular diameter that is, um, this line here is more or less the boundary between the photosphere and the chromosphere. And this is the part in the solar and the sun with the least temperature. As you go inwards towards the center of the sun, the temperature rises. And as you go outwards, the temperature rises. Now, this is not what you would expect from a hot body. A hot body should have, temperature should diminish from the center and continue once you get past the edge. But that is not the case with the sun. If we can take a look at the, a very close look at the surface of the sun, and this has been taken by one of the, the latest solar telescopes, um, I think possibly might be in orbit. Um, we see um, the surface here, the photosphere appears fairly bland and smooth, but uh, if you look at it in a bit more detail, you can see it's broken up and this is called solar granulation. It's like granules. Now each of these is a boiling bubble of gas about the size of the state of Texas in the United States. So this is on a truly vast scale. Um, and th this is the hot gas bubbling up from, in convection to the surface. Um, because the sun is so hot, um, these, uh, this um, gas has had the electrons wholly or partially stripped from it and is in fact called plasma, which is sometimes referred to as the fourth state of matter. It's an electrically conducting fluid, a gas, and as a result of which it's very prone to magnetic influence and also to electrical influence. Now here we can see um, a a picture of a, a large sunspot group, um, quite high definition. We see the, the, gran the granulation here, but what we can see also are these filaments 
or known as fibrils, which are coming out from the center of the, uh, the, uh, the sunspot called the umbra. This area where, this, where the fibrils are is called the penumbra. Um, this appears black only because it's at a lesser temperature than the rest of the sun. This is a few hundred degrees less than the temperature of the photosphere. But because the photosphere is so bright, by contrast, this looks black. But if you were actually there, believe me, this is hot enough to incinerate you. So it's not, uh, it's only a contrast effect. And this is also the site of in an intense magnetic field. And this is why the solar material has been cooled here and also has been um, twisted into these fi uh, fibril like shapes. The picture on the right is taken, this is the chromosphere that we saw pink in the previous slide. Um, uh, during the solar eclipse, but this has been taken in the light of a molecule. It's been taken by the Solar Dynamics Observer Satellite, um, which looks at the sun in uh, ultraviolet wavelengths, high energy wavelength, higher energy than visible light. And this tends to come from the chromosphere. And this has been taken in the light of an, of a, of an element, of an atom, which has had many electrons stripped from it. Um, and what you can see here is the electrically conducting plasma is following magnetic lines of force, such as you might see uh, from a bar magnet, when you put a bar magnet under a piece of paper and scatter iron filings, it will form similar patterns to these, showing the magnetic lines of force. And as you can see, these are erupting from all over the sun. This is, by the way, um, the sun uh, at a slightly more active stage than it is now, but within four or five years, the sun will probably be as active as this. Now, where does the sun get all this energy from? Well, it uses this equation, probably the most familiar, the best known equation in the world to the general public. Um, it states that energy and mass are equivalent and the thing that joins them together, that multiplies them as it were, is the, this letter here, C, which stands for the speed of light. Light is the fastest thing in the universe by definition. Uh, incredibly fast that uh, a light beam would go around the Earth, um, right around the equator of the Earth, five times in one second. Um, and when you multiply the mass by the speed of light and you square the speed of light, that not only makes this a very large amount, it makes it a huge amount. And this is Einstein's equation that shows that mass is equivalent to energy and you can convert mass into energy. Now, this is how it's done on the sun. Um, the immense temperature and density in the sun's core allow hydrogen nuclei to join together to form the element helium, releasing huge quantities of energy. So I won't describe this in any great detail, but essentially hydrogen nuclei come together, do various things, add more hydrogen nuclei, and eventually it forms a helium nucleus. Now, the four hydrogen nuclei on their own have a greater mass than this helium, helium nucleus. The helium nucleus is a more compact arrangement of matter and has a bit less mass for that reason. Um, and that is what actually produces all the energy, whether in the form of fundamental particles here or photons of light, this is a gamma ray, um, that produces all the energy in the sun. And indeed 600 million tons of hydrogen are fused into helium producing the equivalent of 90 billion megatons of TNT exploding continually. Um, now, one of the stranger things about the sun is if you take a cubic meter of the sun and measure how much energy it's producing, it's actually very low. It's only 276 watts, which is actually about the same as a compost heap. And now you wonder, how can something, a giant compost heap, produce all this energy and heat the whole solar system? And the reason is that the sun is just so gigantic and so huge, um, it produces enough energy to keep the whole show afloat. And indeed, that is the reason why um, fusion power, which people have been trying to develop on Earth as a, um, a pollution-free form of energy uh, for decades now, um, are having such hard trouble because um, the sun can only do this because it is so hot and so dense. And to produce these uh, conditions on Earth um, is very, very difficult. And it will probably be a few more decades before we can, we can produce um, thermonuclear energy like the sun. We can do it in hydrogen bombs, but that's uncontrolled and not really 
a very good way to do it. But um, eventually, perhaps, we may be able to emulate the sun and create a star here on Earth. Uh, this, is the, um, this is how the sun is arranged inside. Um, you see the core in the center, and then there's what's called the radiative zone. Um, photons of energy that are leaving the core go into this region, but the, the conditions are such that it has to just bump from one particle to another all the way out and perform something that used to be called drunkard's walk. Um, it basically just goes in a totally random direction and eventually gradually makes its way out to the edge. And it can take an individual particle up to a million years to get from there to here. Traveling at the speed of light, of course, but having such a bouncing and bouncing around so much that it has a, a truly huge path. When it gets to this region here, um, the density of the sun has reduced enough to allow the gas to convect. So it forms huge convection cells of which, uh, which will have smaller cells on top of them down to a kind of manageable size on the surface of the sun. Um, yes, still the size of the state of Texas, but um, uh, this is what we see on the surface. Um, and also we see sunspots um, on there too, which are um, a sign of magnetic activity. And from a sunspot can erupt a prominence that you see here. And this is hydrogen gas, electrically charged and magnetic hydrogen gas, which, for, tends, which forms structures called flux ropes, which are pushed out um, often after a flare, which is where the magnetic field of the sun reconnects itself. It's like a giant short circuit, and again, produces lots of energy. And particles are thrown out from here into the corona. Now, the big um, mystery with the sun is the temperature minimum, as you can see here, is right in between the photosphere and the chromosphere, as we mentioned earlier on. And basically everything out here is getting heated up again. And we think it's because of the magnetic field and the magnetic interactions and something possibly called nano flares, which are tiny, tiny electrical reconnections. These are continually pumping energy into the solar corona, which is allowing it to, um, causing it to glow. The solar corona can't be seen with the naked eye, except during an eclipse, when the, because the, the light of the photosphere just drowns it out completely. Um, the reason why the, the sun's magnetic field is so intense is because of this differential rotation in the sun being a fluid body. And if a magnetic field is established in the sun, and it will thread through all the gas because the gas itself is magnetic. The rotation will wind it up and wind it up tighter and tighter and tighter. And what eventually happens is that the magnetic field becomes so, so uh, knotted up that it begins to erupt through the surface where we see the, um, where we see the sunspots and the magnetic loops. And this here is, uh, it shows basically the, um, the effect of the sun on the rest of the solar system. I'm not going to go into this in too much detail because it's for, going to form a part of a talk we're going to have in September on the aurora. And the aurora is um, very relevant to this. But you can see this, the sun's, um, the particles which are streaming off from the sun um, interact with the Earth, with comets, with the other planets, um, and uh, with the moon as well. Um, but I won't go into this in any more detail because, we're, again, we'll be dealing with this come September. So just to finish off, I'll just leave you with this. This is uh, some film from the NASA Solar Dynamics Observatory. Um, it's greatly speeded up. Um, a picture is taken every 10 seconds and then thrown together. And um, this is about, every second of this footage is about, uh, is about, um, about five minutes of real time. But I can show you even in that time scale, the sun is very dynamic. And we can see here the magnetic field bursting out um, and forming coronal structures. These are known as arcades. Um, and there's just a bewildering, unfathomable um, amount of activity going on in the sun. It's uh, really beyond description, but uh, certainly our science, the science which applies to it, magneto hydrodynamics, um, is having <laughs> a, real, uh, a real problem um, explaining exactly um, how all this comes about and the way it behaves. And as you can see from this prominence here, there's continually matter being thrown out into the solar system. 
the dark areas where not much is, uh, looks as though it's happening are areas where the sun's magnetic field is streaming straight out. And here we can see a solar flare. This is where uh, there's a short circuit in the atmosphere and causes it. This is like thousands of atomic bombs going off at once. So we'll just leave you with that. I think we've more or less come to the end of the presentation. So I'm going to stop sharing the screen. I'll hopefully be able to uh, answer some of your questions. I don't know, have you answered any questions yet, David? Oh, no, I've got, I've got a couple of stacks, stacks up here that I can probably deal with um, uh, as we go. Um, so, for Bruno, uh, the question is, is where did we get the planetarium view of the Celtic skies? Uh, well, I'm afraid it's all my own work. Um, I spent almost a year researching it for the um, Dark Sky Park. Um, I could make it available if people wanted it. There are actually two versions available. Um, one is the earlier one, which is about five to 600 AD, which is fairly exclusively um, Scottish Gaelic. And there's a later one, that's the seventh and eighth centuries AD, um, by which time the, the mythologies of the Picts uh, cult, cult, culturally combined with the um, Gallic mythologies that had come across from the kingdom in the West. And uh, that that's, uh, amalgamation can be found in the Shandwick picture stone up on the northeast coast. Um, don't pay too much attention to my Gallic pronunciation because it's pretty horrible. Um, I, I should say that uh, in terms of the Gallic constellation option and the way that's drawn out, I ought to acknowledge Ray, who was, I think, an American, who believed that the um, constellations in the sky weren't very good representations of what they were meant to be, and he um, redrew them all. You will find it at the bottom of Stellarium, our Western Ray interpretation, and that is the starting point for the um, ones that I've uh, worked on and built up to um, form the planetary in view of the Celtic size we use this evening. So, I've got another one from Eric. Pictures, cut marks have anything to do with stars, asterisms, constellations? Yes, I believe they do. Um, very close to me here, I've got a, a stone circle. It's the Rothimé circle, and it's got over, um, get, get, getting on for 100 cut marks. And curiously, uh, they appear to represent the night sky. And they've been known about for over 100 years. I think there was um, a minister around 1900, 1910, who wrote about them and called them the Rothimé stars. Um, his interpretation uh, probably left a little bit to be desired because um, he had Polaris as being central, which of course it wasn't in those days. The central star when that, that carving was created was probably Thuban. And if you start from that point, you can put everything else in its place. Although curiously, they're actually, it's a mirror image of what you see up in the sky. It's, prob it's quite likely that um, it was created as a representation of a reflection of the sky seen in water, because these people were quite keen on um, looking into the future. And they used to do it by using pools and looking into pools. And I think that's where the idea of having the stars the wrong way around came from. Um, there's another question from Eric, Sam, which is probably uh, more for you. Have, have we got any of our own cl old club solar pics? I'm afraid uh, the only uh, pictures I've got of the sun were from Mercury's transit uh, about four years ago. Um, I have some pictures from that, but I don't have any um, hydrogen alpha or that kind of equipment, so I've not generally been trying to take pictures of the sun. But I think with the upcoming um, solar max coming up, I'll, I'll probably uh, persevere a bit with the um, with the Bader Astro Solar Film and try to get some good pictures of, uh, of sunspots. Um, I think there were some other questions. Um, I'll have a quick look. And um, technical stuff. Um, 
we want to hear from Emma Piercy about the um, is the sun expanding? Um, yes and no. The sun really doesn't expand or contract very much. It will eventually expand um, when, as I said, it runs out of hydrogen fuel when it comes to the end of its main sequence burning um, and then has to um, fuse high, uh, helium, uh, which is a much hotter reaction and causes the outer um, layers of the, of the star to swell. And the sun will swell to so, uh, swell to so much of an extent that it may swallow the Earth. It's a bit on the borderline because one of the other effects of the swelling is that its gravitational field becomes slightly less intense and it would mean that the Earth would move outwards in its orbit. Uh, but whether it's moving outwards enough to escape the expanding outer layers of the sun is another question. And I don't really think uh, uh, there is, the sun doesn't really, uh, isn't really due to expand for another few hundred million, if not a few billion years. So not something we need to worry about. I think you've got a lot of other questions about Celtic sky here, David. Yeah, um, Helen says she'd rather appreciate seeing both uh, versions of the Celtic picture sky. Um, what I would be happy to share with you is the Stellarium um, version of it, so you can look at it uh, to your heart's content. Um, it would have to be wrapped up as a zip file and installed in your Stellarium um, installation if you've got one. Um, but on a website, it's you haven't got the dynamics; you just have it in bits, so you you can't you can't really get the get get a live version online on the web in the same way. Um, Eric's asking me the cut marks at White's Catathon. So wh where are they? I think Eric's saying Brechin. Ah, Brechin. Yeah. I will have to look into that. <laughs> um, there are lots and lots of cut marks. There's, there's over two and a half thousand uh, cut mark um, carvings installations in Scotland. So there's an awful lot to be got through and quite, quite a lot of them are on uh, megalithic monuments that are associated with astronomical alignments. Um, the question here from Helen um, is the heating from the magnetic uh, heating of the plasma of the sun related to the behavior of gas phase versus pressure changes. Um, most of the behavior in the magnetic heating, I think, comes from the magnetic field and the electromagnetic reaction with the gas. There may be some um, gas phases, yes, they may um, have some effect, but in general, the sun's surface is really determined by heat and magnetism. And the electricity. So that is what is really uh, deciding the large scale uh, features there. Um, and I see Yvonne Newton has, um, Yvonne has uh, asked um, uh, as the sun expands, at what point would it start to affect the orbit of the other planets? Well, as we explained, when it gets to the red giant phase, which will be in a couple of billion years' time, um, then it will affect the orbits because as it expands, um, as you pointed out it's, um, its gravitational field weakens and the planets will start to move off into different orbits. If global um, warming has been worrying you, you need to be very, very worried. It will be fried to a complete cinder crisp indeed. before it's swallowed up. <laughs> and eventually the sun will go off, off in a puff of smoke. That's one of those lovely um, planetary nebulae um, that we sometimes uh, admire through our telescopes. Uh, Emma's asked, um, uh, do we know everything about the sun or are there still questions we have unanswered about it? There are many, many questions. Just, just that view of the surface of the sun showing that the, the, the roiling um, mass of electrically conducting gas, um, there's going to be enough questions in that to keep physicists going for generations, I would think. Um, it's a very, very complex field. It's basically if you take fluid dynamics, trying to um, describe the behavior of turbulent gas and then add electricity and magnetism to that and a, a huge source of heat, it just becomes uh, very, very complex. And indeed, I think most of the work that's done in it now is done in computer simulations because uh, uh, the, the equations are so complex and um, it would take you a lifetime to work them out and computers are actually very good at that kind of thing of just number crunching. 
and doing simulations. Of course, if you get the, uh, the, the sampling conditions of the simulation wrong, then you're not going to get the right answer. But the computer does allow you to do it so often that you can get a fairly good approximation as to what's really happening on the sun. So a little uh, message from Eric here. It's not, not a question, but he's uh, uh, just saying that um, Highland will be doing a solar observing webcast soon. And um, some will be open to the public. So get ready to go along and uh, enjoy. Yeah, thanks very much for bringing that up, Eric. It's something we'd like to do, obviously, the year, but uh, with the end, perhaps, of um, the end of COVID, hopefully, at some point, maybe next year. Uh, if we can get the funds, we would have liked to have actually bought a solar telescope, a, you know, a hydrogen alpha telescope, so we could show people what the surface of the sun looks like in real time. But uh, that's perhaps for another day. Maybe we'll just have to make do with something like a solar wedge or something like that. But uh, And thanks once again to all the members of um, HAS and, uh, and Sigma who have uh, been watching this as well. I didn't really get time to chat with you. Um, at the start, I would have liked to, but um, I was too busy boning up with my presentation, which has changed its form about 10 times in the past three days. Um, so, if we, as I say, come September, when we do the Aurora and the like, we'll go into more into the interaction of the, the sun's magnetic field with the rest of the solar system, and indeed the latest theories about the heliopause and uh, now that the Voyager spacecraft are more or less are on the edge of the solar system we might be able to learn a bit more of what, um, what heliospheric space is like as opposed to interstellar space. So do we have any more questions from anyone? If not, um, uh, I'm going to call the proceedings to a close. Uh, that's it for this evening. I'd like to thank Sam for his interesting and informative presentation about the sun itself. Uh, thank you all very much for attending our webinar this evening. We hope to see you again on Monday, the 21st of February next year. Hang on, I'm getting, I'm reading off the wrong bit there. In September, we hope <laughs> to see you again finishing. when we'll, we'll be uh, uh, talking about the uh, Aurora. Uh, it'll be around September. I mean, Aurora has been really very good recently. Um, hopefully it will be just as good in September. So we, we've timed a, a, an Aurora evening for then and um, look forward to seeing you then yes and, and there, there may actually be an extra one i'm the the events that we have on our web page for the dark sky park were actually part of a program that was put together it's mandated by the uh, the international dark sky association and that we um, have to give talks but i would like to try and fit another one in maybe over the summer or even a, another two because um the way we set the talks up before is we would try to have an outside observing session um, after if it was if it was clear um, after the talk in the village hall but um, now that we've got this facility we don't uh, we are free from that so I'd probably like to maybe do a little bit about maybe the summer sky perhaps or something like that because there are interesting things like noctilucent cloud and other phenomena and um, so and satellites the perhaps these days the vexed issue of satellites um, going across the sky but uh, Hopefully I'll be able to manage another, fit another couple of these talks in if anybody's interested in seeing them. So, so thank you very much for, uh, for watching this. It will be available on YouTube. David will be posting on the Facebook page um, and on the web page when it's available. Um, so if you've missed any of it or if any of your friends want to watch it, by all means, just uh, um, keep your eyes open and uh, you'll be able to watch it on YouTube at some point in the future.